Um, yes, so I'm Michael Verani. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Princeton University uh, and in the program of history, uh, history of Science. And uh, my dissertation is on uh, the international mathematics community after World War II. So I look at how, uh, through looking at some particular figures and theories in mathematical analysis and then broader mathematical institutions, uh, how mathematics took the particular international form that um, in many ways we recognize it as having today. Uh, so this talk is uh, an important part of that work. Um, and I want to thank Brendan for um, allowing me to be a part of this. And uh, as I think it's a sign of how well organized the conference is, that as we were going through the earlier um, talks today, I could see parts of each of the talks that tie into themes that I'll uh, hope to raise in the next handful of minutes. So um, without further ado, on April 15th, 1937, Marston Morris, this character, uh, met Warren Weaver to ask for money. Morse had made his name in mathematical analysis at Harvard University before joining the faculty of the recently formed Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey in 1935. Just one month prior, Morse had joined 14 colleagues, primarily from the east coast of the United States, in formalizing a blueprint for an international congress of mathematicians to be held in the United States in 1940. Already at that date, the Congress's planners could count on pledges of $7,500 from each of the Carnegie Corporation of New York and an anonymous source and hoped for further support from the National Academy or National Research Council, with the latter's beneficence courtesy of an unused allocation from Warren Weaver's own Rockefeller Foundation for, quote, international scientific purposes. A further $7,000 was anticipated from membership fees, plus $1,000 from selling proceedings to libraries. This would just cover the cost of printing, housing foreign delegates, and meeting the secretarial needs of organization and publicity. The planners recommended there be no subventions for foreign delegates' travel unless further pledges could be secured. Now, on April 15th, Morse spoke with Weaver as chair of the newly appointed Financial Committee of the Congress. He summarized the expected budget, somewhat inflating a few of the figures to show greater need, and revealed that the anonymous $7,500 sponsor was his own Institute for Advanced Study, except that the Institute had never planned to pay. To allow the Special Committee on the International Congress of Mathematicians, chaired by Morse's colleague Luther Eisenhardt of neighboring Princeton University, to present a balanced budget to the American Mathematical Society, the Congress's hosts, the Institute for Advanced Study had agreed to underwrite the $7,500 sum and then to request it from the Rockefeller Foundation later. <laughs> the Special Committee had determined, owing to a change in personnel within the Rockefeller Foundation, that it would have been inappropriate to trouble the Foundation for funds any time earlier. But without the hoped for funds to match those pledged by the Carnegie Corporation, <coughs> the Congress's financial prospects were precarious at best. The Institute, for its part, hoped to fund lectures and short-term appointments for important European mathematicians so they could be across the Atlantic at the right time. Morse did not mention the expected contributions of Boston area host universities toward expenses, nor did he suppose that the small number of other institutions with the Institute's unusual combination of financial wherewithal and mathematical notability would make much of a dent in the Congress's budget. He knew that scientific organizations like the National Research Council already relied on a small collection of philanthropic benefactors to support their work. Mathematics, it seemed to Morse, was in the unique position of having no natural sources of support. And we were agreed. Not long thereafter, the 1940 Congress became a casualty of the Second World War. Planning was suspended on September 6, 1939, and Morse became chair of the Emergency Committee, whose first task included convincing donors to allow the American Mathematical Society to keep their contributions in trust, quote, until a more favorable time. I have lingered on Morse's meeting with Weaver, a non-committal overture for funds for an international meeting that did not take place, because it shows many features of the funding situation for mathematics between the world wars, and underscores the contrast with what would follow. By this time, mathematicians had long earned their keep as salaried scholars teaching and conducting research in institutes, universities, and academies. Conditions varied from place to place. Institutions subsisted on various forms of state and private largesse, as did scientific societies and other state and non-state organs of organized professional activity. In the mid-1930s, a top American mathematician could command as much as $20,000 in annual salary. While most made much less than that, uh, rarely topping $10,000, uh, routine personnel costs for mathematics quickly dwarf those faced by the Congress's organizers. And different academic structures, like professorships versus fellowships versus academic chairs, um, combined with war conditions, make comparisons with Europe difficult, 
Um, but we're looking at something like the same order of magnitude if you look at other major centers of mathematics beyond the United States, which was only just then becoming a major center of mathematics. Um, but elite mathematicians were few. Mathematics outside of, relative, of relatively isolated teaching posts. Um, sorry, uh, and there was elite mathematicians were few. There was little infrastructure to support non-elite mathematics outside of isolated teaching posts. And even the elites sometimes face problems funding their publications, conferences, and other undertakings. Mathematicians as such were not particularly sought after employees in firms that employed engineers, actuaries, and other highly trained mathematical practitioners. Outside the most developed corners of Europe, North America, and a few scattered outposts, mathematicians sometimes could hardly count on a salary, much less a well-stocked library or the means to travel and publish. The Second World War changed the funding situation for mathematics in part by altering existing channels of revenue, particularly those associated with state-sponsored societies and institutions, and in part by furnishing sources of support either wholly new or new to mathematicians. These changes increased the scope of mathematical participation and activity both in its traditional centers and on its widening periphery. They offered mathematicians new roles in industry and statecraft, reminiscent perhaps of those familiar from prior eras, but very new nonetheless, and made connections between mathematicians in different roles and from different places, both increasingly possible and increasingly routine. Though I have time only to illustrate some of these changes, I claim they made possible a post-war mathematical community that was far more global and far-reaching than its predecessors. The financial infrastructure of post-war mathematics was formally quite different from what it replaced, but it relied on informal relationships and structures that predated the war. As a result, the discipline of mathematics changed starkly in scale without changing nearly so starkly in structure. So where historians of physics, for example, see a discipline whose very epistemic principles were transformed by the quote, big science of second, the Second World War propelled, within mathematics one sees uh, surprisingly similar transformations in fiscal base with decidedly more ambivalent consequences for its organization and subjects matter. Changes one does see, such as a market proliferation of research seminars, appear here as conservative adaptations distinctly enabled by fiscal transformations, but not defined by them. In January 1942, Harvard President and Chairman of the National Defense Research Committee, James Bryan Conant, a chemist, was said to have remarked to his counterpart, Frank Jewett of the National Academy of Sciences, what would become a truism for Americans and those brought by the war's end. <coughs> the last war was a war of chemistry, but this one is a war of physics. To that, Jewett, and Jewett an electrical engineer, <coughs> replied, it may be a war of physics, but the physicists say it is a war of mathematics. If the Second World War seemed, even to some, as a war of mathematics, it owed in no smart, small part to the strenuous efforts of a small number of well-connected American mathematicians who aggressively courted military patronage in the 1940s. Latching on to the notions of total war and the so-called manpower problem, these figures aggressively sought the ear of military officials, who, and especially any like Conan and Jewett, who seemed to have the ear of military decision makers. Morse, then president of the American Mathematical Society, joined with the Mathematical Association of America to institute a war policy committee in order to advocate for the mathematicians' professional interests in the war effort. Their public relations offensive included surveys, formal reports circulated to policymakers, letters and short commentaries in general scientific publications such as science, radio interviews, letter campaigns, and in-person meetings with prominent officials. As Marshall Stone wrote in 1940, quote, if mathematics is to be brought to bear upon our defense problems in full measure, we shall have to organize and conduct propaganda to this end. Among the many outgrowths of this effort was the creation of, in 1943 of an applied mathematics panel at the Office of Scientific Research and Development, a civilian organization in 1942, uh, established in 1942 to support American military operations. Uh, and I should note the term applied mathematics panel, the word applied there is meant mainly to appeal to sponsors. Um, the mathematicians on the panel would not generally consider themselves applied mathematicians in many cases. Um, the panel did include several grandees of the American Mathematical Society, including several who would play central roles in organizing the renewed International Congress of Mathematicians in 1950. By no means incidentally, the panel was directed by Warren Weaver, who saw the Rockefeller Foundation. At the suggestion of panelist Richard Courant, Weaver invited Minna Reese to join as a technical aide, and it was her work 
um, the AMP that set the template for Reese's influential position, brokering funding for both pure and applied mathematics at the Office of Naval Research after the war. That's Reese. Um, the mathematical research operations of the Applied Mathematics Panel and the Office of Naval Research were, by and large, based on a contract model. Academic mathematicians organized into research centers on broad topics like dynamics, differential equations, or statistics, with a small number of established researchers and varying the size and rotating cast of postdoctoral and doctoral student <coughs> assistants, and would be assigned contracts centered on particular research questions formulated or refined by expert mathematicians on the AMP or consulting with the ONR. Letters and reports from the War Policy Committee stressed the value of dividing labor between the small group of elite mathematicians capable of formulating problems for research and a much larger group of competent working mathematicians who could solve those mathematical problems. So note in particular the contrast with the Bourbaki view of mathematics from the same time period mentioned by Michael Harris earlier today. They, uh, they rarely stressed, but could take for granted, the relatively compact informal network of acquaintances established through regional and national mathematical societies and conferences, reinforced by an old boys network that assured a relatively robust awareness among well-placed mathematicians of the competencies and special expertise to be found at different sites of research. Total war provided the impetus for mathematicians to insert themselves into military funding infrastructures, but it could not guarantee their continued integration at the end of hostilities. Mathematicians who had learned to apply their theoretical expertise toward military problems during, uh, during the war transitioned quickly to applying the military's willingness to finance applied research toward financing their theoretical projects, often by continuing wartime research groups. Solomon Lefschetz, for instance, at Princeton, directed an ONR-sponsored differential equations project from 1946 to 1959, which traced its origins to Lefschetz's war work and contacts from 1942. The U.S. Navy funded a considerable amount of departmental administrative and overhead costs, a weekly research seminar, occasional conferences and salaries or subventions for established scholars, postdoctoral researchers, and 15 graduate students who completed doctorates under the project. So it's a little under one a year. Uh, and Lefschetz's summary report to the Navy made note of his group's mathematical findings, but it placed a particular emphasis on the personnel value of the Navy's support, particularly in developing the talents of younger scholars. Mathematicians during and after the war maintained the potential future military usefulness of their present theoretical work could be significant, but was hard to evaluate, and might not be manifest for some time. The promise of such research was enough to secure military sponsorship for a wide range of research and publication activities, including efforts devoted to particular problems or theoretical programs. Uh, what was immediately manifest, however, was a felt shortage of qualified mathematical practitioners and instructors to capitalize on the manifest usefulness of existing mathematical techniques. So you see funding for mathematical research and the creation of new mathematics distinctly motivated by the goal of creating people capable of using old mathematics. And that's a key theme that goes throughout this period. So mathematicians thus inserted themselves into broader discussions of scientific manpower and stipulated the urgency of funding advanced research and education not primarily for its research output, but for the reserve of skilled mathematicians it would make available in times of war. This kind of advocacy for peacetime mobilization was a significant motive for the American Mathematical Society's decision in September 1945 to convert the War Policy Committee into a longer-term Policy Committee for Mathematics existed for much a very long time after the war. Um, the Policy Committee for Mathematics, like the War Policy Committee, was financed by annual grants of a few thousand dollars from the Rockefeller Foundation. The new Policy Committee worked with other policy groups and advisory organs to advocate for the continued support of mathematical research and higher education under both civilian and military auspices. Um, they didn't really consider the private sector uh, as part of their discussions, um, but when it did come up, it was sort of as a useful place for um, placing mathematicians uh, whose uh, potential military benefit could be realized in a time of war, but that's where they could go and work during peacetime beneficially. Like its predecessor, the policy committee mixed formal and informal studies and analysis with the er, formal studies and analysis with the informal organization and cultivation of con uh, contacts that might facilitate funding for mathematics. Formal reports considered, for instance, how to structure a national science foundation or, an, uh, or whether to reestablish an international <coughs> mathematical union. Uh, both of these came to fruition in 1950. Informal contacts often worked in service of formal petitions and for resources. Thus, members of the American Mathematical Society, who had worked closely with Minna Reese on the Applied Mathematics panel during the war, turned to her after the war to help them win Office of Naval Research funding for a project 
to translate Russian mathematical articles shortly thereafter, in 1948. An initial grant of $25,000 would pay for the translation of some 730 pages of Russian language mathematics per year, with 150 copies of the translations furnished to the Navy for distribution, and the remainder uh, circulated directly to the American Mathematical Society. So they were funding sort of research that the Navy wanted 150 copies of in translation from Russian. Uh, the grant also funded the production of a pamphlet of Russian technical terms and basic grammar and a small amount for executive and clerical overhead. The Russian translation project, unlike grants for conferences and research groups, was justified to its military sponsors as an efficient response to a problem in the availability of research. The project's backers insisted on the high quality of particular branches of Soviet mathematical research and its importance for advancing related research in the United States although the range and military relevance of articles varied considerably, and military relevance was not a stated criterion for choosing which articles to be translated. Here, the advances in mathematics were, in themselves, a military prerogative. This notion of mathematics itself as a military prerogative found voice in Marston Morse's advice to the Air Force Office of Scientific Research in 1957 that, quote, the Air Force cannot leave the job of supporting mathematics, which it has such a great stake in, to the wings of the National Science Foundation or any other such organization. Morse and Marshall Stone, who we heard from earlier, were particularly vocal, but joined by a large share of their academic colleagues in minimizing the distinction between pure and applied mathematics, a distinction that might otherwise make their own theoretical work seem less urgent as a funding priority. Rather, they emphasized the, quote, lessons of the history of science, and particularly the way mathematics has unexpectedly affected scientific theory. Should be noted also there's a big contemporary boom in writing histories of mathematics that stress this eventual usefulness of theoretical discoveries um, by mathematicians. Uh, resources that were too specifically tailored toward any ends, uh, concrete or otherwise, would only lead to a, quote, gold rush toward well-funded areas, um, uh, well areas and the production of, quote, pseudo-mathematics, not driven by the discipline's internal values and processes. The Russian translation project is also typical in using resources from past projects to justify the viability of future ones. Although they, did, although they did not note the substantial sums the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Corporation that made the Mathematical Reviews uh, Review Journal thinkable in its early years, the Russian translation project's uh, proposers stressed the value of the publishing and article curating expertise that the Mathematical Reviews promised uh, for the new, uh, also to use for the Russian translation project. Indeed, even during the establishment of the Mathematical Reviews, its two principal sponsors were not kept fully apprised of each other's contributions. In particular, a sizable longer-term commitment from the Carnegie Corporation was conveniently omitted from grant reports in 1940 and 1941 to the Rockefeller Foundation, the other major sponsor, which instead presented just enough of the undertaking's balance sheet to suggest that the Foundation's contribution was sufficient, but also necessary. Proposals and progress reports emphasized the costs and technical intricacy of publishing and the international scope of the journal's operations which the journal's proponents advanced as, respectively, the biggest sources of financial need, publishing, and political benefit, international cooperation. No single project loomed larger after the war with respect to the values of international cooperation than the International Congress of Mathematicians. It was, in part, Warren Weaver's doubts about the Rockefeller Foundation's ability to extend its financial commitment without formal reconsideration beyond 1950 that spurred the Congress's Emergency Committee in 1946 to settle on a 1950 date and resume planning in earnest. At the end of 1946, however, the financial outlook of the Congress looked considerably different from the pre-war situation, where in 1938 the Committee on the Invitation of Speakers projected a desired minimum of just some 30 travel grants to approximately $100, of approximately $100 per person. The Emergency Committee's European informants now informed them that attendance would be all but financially impossible without support from abroad for European delegates. Money for travel quickly became the largest threat to a Congress the organizers hoped would be, quote, truly international. And truly international is a phrase that comes up over and over and over again in the planning documents. Um, and it's borrowed from interwar discussions we can talk about if you'd like. Before the war, foreign delegates, which meant in nearly every case European delegates, were expected to fund their attendance from a combination of personal resources, support from their home institutions and national scientific societies, and allowances for travel from North American institutions they might visit on either side of the Congress for lectures or other exchanges. This last source of support remained a considerable resource, one that is unfortunately difficult to document comprehensively, but we can get a sense of individual cases and looking at contemporary qualitative remarks. But something would have to replace the first two sources. 
On top of this, a foreign delegate was no longer necessarily a European one. Philanthropic enterprises, including the Rockefeller and Guggenheim Foundations, had, since the interwar period, but accelerating after the war, vastly increased the integration of mathematicians from Latin America with the established institutions of North America and, to a lesser extent, Europe. They were joined after the war by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, which also supported mathematical liaisons to North Africa, South Asia, and other developing regions. Um, there's not a lot of room to elaborate here, but it's significant that UNESCO followed on the heels of these philanthropic sponsors, who helped to establish a great deal of the personal and material infrastructure and expectations on which UNESCO's programs rely. One should note as well that these institutions played a major role in shaping European and American mathematics, and to take one example, the Rockefeller Foundation was a sufficient supporter of the Bourbaki group in France that a Rockefeller Fellowship was listed on one of Nicolas Bourbaki's unsuccessful applications to the American Mathematical Society. With a combination of fellowships for scholars from the developing world to pursue doctorates or higher research abroad, and a system of programs to provide technical assistance, including sponsoring medium-term visits from elite mathematicians to the developing world, there was now a considerable number of mathematicians from beyond Europe and <coughs> North America who could reasonably expect and hope to attend the Congress. Many applied to these same organs for fellowships time to put them in the right region of the United States at the right time, while others applied directly to the Congress for subventions. UNESCO supplied $10,000 directly to the Congress for this purpose, and in addition sponsored travel of delegates from 23 countries, nine of which outside, uh, from outside Europe and North America, to an organizing conference for a revived International Mathematical Union to take place in New York just before the Congress. The Congress ultimately directed, uh, directly subsidized the travel of over 100 delegates, and made offers as well to many who were prevented from attending by the Iron Curtain. By the reckoning of the Transportation Grants Chairman, the Congress managed to subsidize between a third and a half of the total travel expenses of grant recipients, who pieced together the rest of their funding from other sources. The total cost topped $24,000, about a quarter of the Congress's final budget, with most grants between $1 and $200. The next largest, The next largest costs for the Congress were as follows. One quarter went to publication, and three quarters of that cost was borne by the Carnegie Corporation. An eighth went toward housing foreign delegates, and another eighth went toward the cost of organization. Uh, hiring an orchestra to perform to the standards of the European visitor visitors was also not cheap. They were very chagrined not to be able to get the uh, Boston Symphony. Uh, early in the post-war organization effort, the American Post began pursuing another sponsor that would not have seemed such a, quote, natural source of support before the war. World work had put academic mathematicians into contact not just with the military, but also a much wider range of industrial interests which might contribute for the International Congress. As early as the summer of 1946, before hostilities had ended in the Pacific Theater, Canadian mathematicians had suggested to the Americans that they had had great success courting the insurance industry, a major employer of mathematical graduates. All told, commercial sponsors contributed some $18,000 toward the Congress with the largest shares coming from the insurance, electrical, and telecommunications, and oil industries. So these are the industrial sponsors. These are just in general. And the philanthropy is almost entirely Carnegie and Rockefeller. Um, the Congress's organizers stressed to all of these sponsors their contribution toward international peace and cooperation. And perhaps this is why military sponsors did not directly fund this particular endeavor, although they no doubt supplied funds to individual delegates to make their trips. I'll close by suggesting two sorts of questions that charts and stories like these might raise. First, we're used to the idea that funding can affect the direction of research, although we're less likely to assume this for less expensive disciplines like mathematics. But we should also recognize that funding infrastructures can have a major effect on disciplinary identity and other aspects of organization. Important ideas about the relationship, for instance, between different arms of pure and applied mathematics were articulated around and after World War II in the context of specific efforts to appeal to sponsors. How might structures such as a fellowship and contract-based funding change the character of mathematical collaboration and output? How did the tension between appearing viable and demonstrating a need shape the scope of mathematical projects? So for instance, why didn't uh, the ICM go ahead and, and say they didn't have the second $7,500 grant, which might have allowed them to request an even larger sum uh, or conduct an even larger Congress than they had in mind? And a related question you might see between the lines here is how mathematicians secured hegemony over the teaching of calculus and other areas of mathematics that are not a part of their ordinary research, 
but are an outsized part of their institutional justification in higher education. I would suggest that the intervention, their intervention in the scientific manpower problem during this period had a lot to do with this. Second, paying attention to funders can make some features of disciplinary organization visible in different ways. For instance, the predominance of military and philanthropic funding meant a very few, very powerful men had an outsized influence on the prerogatives that govern access to resources. Well-known barriers to women and ethnic and cultural minorities in these areas limited the attention sponsors paid to gender and other forms of difference. In the closed world of mathematical sponsorship, it was easy for sponsors and recipients alike to maintain the conceit of universality and colorblindness while undeniably perpetuating gendered and otherwise segregating regimes of access and control. There's a great response by J.R. Klein to um, this survey for the Committee on Social Research of Chicago, um, which asked how, what their policies and participation were from um, people from various minorities. And Klein said, we have no formal restrictions on people joining our society, so we refuse to fill out the survey and actually do an assessment of the presence of minorities in, uh, in the society. Uh, to take this strand one step further, women did, with mathematical training, did in fact assume some important places in the infrastructure uh, the funding infrastructure by occupying crucial administrative roles. And the main example of this is Minna Rees, but there are many people, um, particularly the Office of Naval Research and UNESCO. So we often ask how these constrained avenues of participation affected the broader community of mathematics. So questions like these help us explore not just how mathematicians interact with public culture, the theme of this conference, but how public culture shapes mathematics directly, profoundly, and in ways we might not otherwise recognize. Thank you.